My name is Antoinette Polito, and I work at the Oregon Health and Science University PA program. So what we want to talk about today is the idea of changing our curriculum. Should we? Will we? Why should we? What's up with that? If you're like our school, um, all of a sudden somebody got this kind of hair that, you know, lectures aren't good. Why are we doing lectures? Students hate lectures. Lectures are boring. And then some of us are old enough to say, well, you know what? We learned by lectures, and we're doing just fine. And then we start in with the new millennial generation, and people have a short attention span, and you know, there's lots of controversy. And raise your hand if that's the kind of discussion you're having in your university setting. Absolutely, right? So how many people here come from programs that are primarily lecture-based? Right, that's why we're here. So we're trying to mix it up a little bit. Who comes from a program that does a lot of team-based learning? OK, we do a little. Yeah, who comes from any program that does problem-based learning? Even better. So we'll have an opportunity, I hope, to share some ideas. So back in the day, meaning the Middle Ages, um, people started lecturing, and it worked just fine. But the idea was that students knew nothing, okay? Came from this idea that they sort of grew up as blank slates or empty vessels, and then us wise, wise people would come and pour knowledge into them. My favorite part of this, of course, is that that knowledge is all pouring out right here, <laughs> right? So old school means lecture, and old school was just fine. There's some really good reasons to give lectures. One of the things that I think is very helpful is if you have a difficult concept and you have all of your 40, 50, 60, I see a few dookies, so I'm going to say 90 people in your class, um, it helps to talk to them all at the same time, right? You can get that one challenging point across and not have to hopefully say it. 90 times. If you want to be a model for how to organize your thinking, you could be guilty of death by PowerPoint, but at the same time, students have a way to go back and look at the way you thought about your rational ideas. I'm going to teach you a topic. Here's how I organize it. Might be a good way for you to think about it, too. You might end up coming up with a different idea, but at the same time, it's a model. Problem solving is something that is actually best done not in a lecture, but there are certainly times where you come to the end of the lecture and you've solved the case or solved the problem, and again, you're modeling it for your students all at the same time. And then sometimes you'll get those questions, and you'll get those attitudes, and you'll get those confusions, and you'll be able to address those in the moment, and I think that can be really helpful. Lecture's certainly efficient, right? If we think about time on task, if we spend 50 minutes drilling down pulmonary disease, and then we're done. Right? Everybody got it all at once, and you're out of here. We know that it doesn't really work that way, but that's what we think. And again, I think it's really hard to argue, because if you're like me, that's how you were taught. And at the risk of sounding as old as I am, you know, if it worked for me, kids, it'll work for you, right? And that may or may not be true. So anyone who knows me would never mistake me <clears throat> for a sage on the stage, although this is actually my first experience of being up on a stage. Right? It's kind of nice, um, but it's kind of funny, too, because I'm like looking out and seeing people, and it's not really how I roll. But Middle Ages, not so long ago, right? So some things really haven't changed. These people sitting quietly in the audience, just like y'all are doing, and, um, and somebody wise up there with poor posture, which I'm also guilty of at the podium, um, talking to them. So even Plutarch back in the day knew that that might not definitely be the best way to inspire people. As we know, lectures aren't perfect, right? What do they not do? They don't usually give individual feedback to learners. So when you're working in a small group collaboratively with a couple of students, you can give them individual feedback. If I see all of y'all out there, it's hard for me to pinpoint any one person. And it's usually not appropriate. We often don't want to call our students out. Um, we say things like, there's no dumb question. And in our mind, we're like, that was a dumb question. <laughs> right? But we usually don't want to call them out in front of everybody. <laughs> um, there's no opportunity to connect with a variety of learning styles, right? If you learn by hearing and you learn by taking notes, like I do, lectures rock your world. But if you don't, you're out of luck, right? Because there's nothing else I'm doing up here in the moment that would inspire you if you're visual or kinesthetic, right? Active learning, again, you are being a passive vessel, and there's no doubt about it. There's nothing I'm doing at this moment that is actively engaging you. I have those students who can't sit still, 
and I see them in the back of the classroom, they'll get up, and we encourage them to do this and sort of do some jumping jacks and calisthenics, and that's them being actively engaged, but it's not necessarily being actively engaged in learning the topic. They're just trying not to fall asleep. And independent learning is, doesn't happen in a lecture format, right? In the best cases, we hope, we hope so much that we're inspiring our students to go forth and learn more, but they're usually kind of busy, and they don't always do that, right? So there's, there's something to that SAGE model, right? If you're like me, you have mentors, really strong, amazing teachers who stood up in front of you and inspired you to be the PAs and educators that you are today, and I thank those people. It's just that, again, it doesn't always happen. Even on our best days, we don't inspire everyone, right? So what is urgently needed in our educational program is students who become actively engaged in learning and not just in believing what we tell them, okay? If we expect students, and we expect this of all our physician assistant students, to be problem solvers, we have to train them to solve problems. And there's nothing about the lecture that trains you to solve a problem. If I'm giving you the lecture, I already solved the problem, and I'm gonna show you how I did it, and you may or may not learn from that, but chances are you won't remember very much of it down the road. So this is one of my favorite quotes, and this, I think this describes most of our faculty meetings, right? I know it does mine. So the good news is that you don't have to throw the baby out with the bathwater, and I just want to say that no babies were harmed in the making of this lecture, <laughs> right? Had I known more about the Peabody Ducks, I would have tried to incorporate some kind of duck fountain reference, but that was new to me when I got here. So we can just do a few different things to make our lectures better, more engaging, more along the lines of what our administrators would like to see, and more along the lines of what our students um, hopefully will be inspired by. So we can enter the 21st century, right? Sometimes my students look at me and they're like, you know, it's the 21st century, right? And I'm like, yeah, it's not like I was born in the 19th century. I know something. But again, they usually have to show me how to use my phone, so it's not that helpful. So if you have a 50 minute, how many people have a 50 minute lecture base? All right, that's a lot of people, not everyone. There are some easy things we can do and some important things that we can do to break up that time more effectively. So we want our learners to learn more. And I also think that my favorite thing about this is that it's more fun for faculty, right? Some of us like giving lectures, it's what we do. Other people hate giving lectures, and that's good news because you always have to give a lecture. But even if you give a lecture and you give the same one over and over, that gets to be a little bit boring. So I think sometimes that comes across in our voice and in our tone. And so we want to spice things up a little bit for everyone involved. So how many people are familiar with David Kolb? Okay, yeah, a lot of us are sort of working on our educational um, training as we go through this and learning more about ed theory. So if you're a geek like me, you know, we call it experiential learning, right? But we know what that means in medical education. It means that I teach you something and I throw you into a new circumstance and I see if you can make it work, right? And that new circumstance might be a patient case. Right? I teach you about a CDC and what those numbers mean. And then I say, here, here's a patient case. Here's some signs and symptoms. Here's some numbers. Can you put what you learned into this new setting and solve this problem? Well, I hope you can. But if I did, you didn't learn that from a lecture, right? Because that's just me talking. So we want to have some opportunities for that engagement. And you want to have the patient, the, excuse me, the student. We teach patients too. But you want to have the student actively trying to process that information through their own brain right, in order to try to get better at that. So it's not something that just happens, right? It's not something that you stand up here and sort of glow and other people just get it, right? It's not contagious. So <laughs> we go in there and we think that, again, you know, because I know something and because I want to tell you something and because I'm all head up about something, that you're just going to come out of there like knowing it. And sadly, that just doesn't usually work. I mean, we want it to, but it doesn't usually work. So let's talk about neuroscience. 50 minutes, not really 50 minutes. This is an awesome book if you haven't read it yet. David Seuss is How the Brain Learns. Talks about kind of our attention span, not just the millennials, many of us baby boomers are also um, had our brains evaluated. And what we learned is that those first 20 minutes of the sacred 50, that period where we are right now, doing pretty good. I can see people are kind of still with me, right? Still kind of looking up. Not all the phones are out yet. When we get to um, the last 10 minutes, 
It's going to be awesome again. Everybody's going to be like, oh, it's almost time to go. It's almost lunchtime. Yeah, we got those box lunches coming. And everybody will be like awake and aware. It's those 20 minutes in between. Not happening. Okay? It's not going to be happening for you. And it's not going to be happening for your students. And that's science. So this is something for you visual learners, right? So if you look, we are doing a good job up here. Oh, we are about to slide down into the valley of death where nobody's paying attention. You've seen this. But then we're going to come up and we're going to wrap it up and we're going to end. David Cole did his work on 40-minute classes. Ours are 50, but I think you get the point. I just want to tell you a little bit about how you might be able to use that time more effectively. So prime time one, that first 20 minutes, science shows us and data supports that certain things are going to be helpful to do in that time period. This is when you should get some new information. So if you have some new things to teach your students, you want to do it right up front. This is not a good time to say to your students, what do you know about pulmonary embolism? Because three out of seven are going to say something ridiculous, and everybody's going to remember it. Because you remember, <laughs> you remember what happens in those first 20 minutes. So you only want correct information to go out into the world during that time. So most of that is going to come from you. Okay? You want to build from previous knowledge. So you want to say, you know what? Remember last week? I know you don't remember last week, but we were here. And we were talking about pulmonary embolism. What did we learn again? And then you're more likely to get some answers that were valid. And you'll see where they are. And you'll say, OK, I see that you actually absorbed a lot from that lecture. And let's take it to the next step. Boom, go. So they have that frame of reference. And we're going to assess their knowledge. So those of you who do TBL, right? That's why we do those individual readiness assessment tests and the group readiness assessment tests right when you walk in the door. Because I want to know how much you know before I start yapping at you, right? And it's, again, it's, it's based on data. Prime time two, that period of time right before you leave for lunch, that's good for reinforcing, right? Because your mind is open again. You're like, all right, I see you up there. I'm paying attention. What do you want me to take home? What's the take home message? Right? And I always try to have my lectures end with the take home points. And you want to summarize that and send them on their way. Okay? But you can't give them 50 new minutes of information. And you can't say, oh, wait, wait, wait. We didn't go over the most important thing as you're walking out the door is this. Right? That's what patients do. Right? <laughs> when you're in there and you talk for those minutes and then you're about to leave and you have your hand on the doorknob and they're like, oh, I know I didn't mention this. But the real reason I came in, and you're just like, no, don't do it to me. So, and the real reason is always that I'm dizzy, right? And it's going to be some four-hour workup. Anyway, so it looks like downtime isn't good for anything, but that's not true. It's just not good for lecturing. So we know that during downtime, learners need to use the information. So what if we gave them 20 minutes of new information, and we said, use it, and then we came back in those last 10 minutes and we said, what did you learn? Great, go home, right? So they need to be active during that time. So we're going to talk about active strategies, right? Plenty of time to lecture, little active strategy, and then those take home points. Sometimes I might stand up here and tell you how I work through a case, or I might even show you how I do a suture or how I place the IV. That's not as helpful as you actually doing it, right? It's second best, and there are times when demonstrations will be helpful, but it's usually something that people won't master without doing it themselves. So interactive windows, that's this idea of you know up, down, doing something different every 20 minutes. And that's going to help us learn better. It's going to help our learners learn better. It's going to help us have more fun. Remember, we're all here to have fun. So you can give your content. You can make it stick. You can give them an opportunity to learn something, but the downside of that is you have less time to talk, right? Turns out that's really an upside, but it's very hard for us to let go of that. They're going to learn more about their own learning, and this is where the problem-based learning folks get this totally, and they're way ahead of us, right? I totally believe that we need all of these approaches in our interactions with students, and there's no one best way. And again, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but people who do PBL sort of get that, that students are more than capable of setting their own agenda, right? They know what they don't know. We do this in review sessions. We get all our students together, and we're like, so, pulmonary embolism, what do you not know? And they look at each other, and they're like, 
okay, I don't know this, I do know this, I don't know. They set their own priorities for learning, and then we send them to learn that actively. Okay, and again, when you're working in those small groups, students are not only learning their material, but they're learning all those other wonderful things you want them to learn, right? How to talk to other people, how to look over your computer and make eye contact. That's a big one for me, right? I'm like, y'all need to look me in the eye. And, um, and some students have a really hard time with that. So they get to talk to their peers and learn from them and be respectful, learn all those good teamwork skills that we want them to have. So again, two great educators. Things have to go through your mind, right? And, and students, if, if I can make a generalization, I think this was true of me when I was 25 too, but I wasn't trying to be a PA. So people don't want you to tell them what to think. They don't want you to tell them what to do, right? There's a little bit of resistance in all of us when we try to say, just do it. Just trust the process, right? We have to say that too, because we do know the process works. But there's a time when they need to feel the process working for them and not just blindly trust things. So this is us being happy because we're going to encourage these group activities. So it's going to give us a little break from talking. We are going to see, and you've seen this if you do TBL or PBL, we're going to see our learners engaged and loud and excited and talking. And you're like, they are talking about pathology reports. I had that, that experience this summer. I was like, I let them go. And they were teaching each other about histology. And it was a beautiful, beautiful thing. So let's talk about what you can do during your downtime. Oh, look, it's 20 minutes after. That's good, right? OK. So there are many things you can do. And one of the references I list here is a book by Barclay. And it's an entire book of things to do, essentially, during downtime. OK, it's about collaborative learning techniques, but it's, it's this very process. What can we do to take a few minutes out of our lecture and do something different? So as you read through this list, you'll see there's ways to encourage discussion. There's ways to encourage reciprocal learning, students teaching each other, learning from each other. That can't be bad. How to get better at problem solving, right? And we know they need that. How we can use our students' capabilities to organize things graphically and work with those visual learners and learn some new ways of consolidating information. And then if you're like me, you bemoan the lack of writing ability amongst the younger generation. And I'm just going to say it. So it's not true for everyone, but I find that our students, whether it's because they have a primarily science background and I didn't before being a PA, whatever, I think their writing needs to be improved. Hands up if you agree. Yes. OK. So it's not just me. And so there are ways to help our students write better, right? And sometimes people will say to me, well, I don't have to write when I'm a PA. I'm like, oh, that's not true. You have to talk to people. You might end up wanting to write a paper. Who knows? But you, um, at the very least, need to get your thoughts out clearly. So we're going to just talk through a couple of these techniques. They won't be something that you've never heard of, probably. And if you've already experienced it, there's going to be a moment where we're going to do a little interactive activity and, um, and tell each other our thoughts. But think pair share is one of these very basic, very, very easy to do concepts where, as the instructor, I've cleverly thought of a very thought-provoking question prior to class. And I look at my class and I say, here is my very thought-provoking question for you. I want you to think for a moment about your answer to that question. And then there's silence. And everybody's thinking profound thoughts about that question. And then I say, I want you to turn to your neighbor and hear their profound thoughts and share yours with them and have a little think-pair-share. And then I want you to stop. And I'm going to say to you, so what did we learn? And I might call on a couple people in the class. Right? This class could be 100 people. It could be 10. It works for any size. And I'm going to say, tell me some of the things that came out of your discussion. And you're probably going to hear really good ideas, right? Because you might have had some ideas about your um, question and how you were going to answer it. But if you get 100 people talking about it, you're probably going to get some really interesting answers. And then they get to hear each other. How much time you want to spend on that if it's 20 minutes? You know, you hear from a lot of people. If you want to spend 10, you hear from whoever you got. Some people always want to talk. Other people, you're like, you know what, so-and-so? You're pretty shy, and I'd love to hear what you thought. All right, so you have the chance to call people out gently. This is one of my favorites for early in the year when students are having a little trouble figuring out how to take in all that information from their lectures in PA school, right? The proverbial water, fire hose, fire hydrant um, analogy that we spray them with every year. Um, Tell your students that you want them to take some notes as you're talking. And then what you do is you really sort of stop. 
you break them up and you pair them up. Now secretly, you could let them pair up with whoever they want, but what if two not so good learners are pairing up together? That's fine too, but you could also insidiously make this a remediation exercise where you pair people up and you might already know after a few weeks who's a relatively strong note taker and who's not. And you can see here that person A will say, here's the notes that I just took on Antoinette's lecture. And person B will say, that's pretty good, but you totally missed this part that I have here. Oh, wouldn't our notes be better if we put them together? Let's do that. And then they synthesize their notes and then they stop and you go on to the next section. You can't do this every lecture, right? That's gonna take forever and I almost said something else. It's gonna take a really long time. <laughs> um, but you have them go back and forth and this is something that I will often send them off to do in um, their remediation work, in their study groups, right? I want you to write down everything you know about pulmonary embolism, turn to Jane, she's gonna compare her notes with yours and I bet you're gonna find some commonalities but also learn a little bit from each other. Send a problem, this is super fun for problem solving. You have little folders or envelopes and each one has a thought provoking case. And you have your students work in groups, usually two to four. And I give them an envelope on their desk and I say, you know, open this and see what it says. And it'll be some sort of mildly complicated situation. It could be an ethical dilemma, right? If you're doing ethics, it could be a complicated case with some labs and diagnostic studies if you're doing that whatever the course warrants, and you let them work in that group on it. And they're gonna solve this problem, and they're gonna say, you know, here's the points I see, they're gonna write this down, they're gonna say, and here's our solution. Then they're gonna fold everything up and put it back in the envelope, okay? But their solution is on the back page, so that when you then take those envelopes and give them to a different team, right? They open it up, they see the problem, and they don't yet see the answer from the other team, but they work through the same thing. And they say, here's how we're gonna solve this problem. And you do that going around, and then the very last group, each group takes that envelope, sees all the problem solving that's gone on before, and takes it all into account and genuinely solves that problem in a really informed way. And then of course you have them share with each other. So they get to see how a problem is solved better by lots of heads, right? And they sort of intuitively know that, but here they were working in a group and they thought they came up with a great solution, but five groups later that solution is awesome and they get to learn from that. And I think it really, you know, can stretch their minds a little bit. Jigsaw is really good for helping students teach each other. So you have a group, and in this case, you know, kind of depends on how big your group is, but, or your classes, but say you have five students working together and you have five groups, right? Don't you all wish you had 25 students in your program? <laughs> Maybe you have them in different rooms with different preceptors. The group has a topic that they're gonna become an expert on and they can use any resources they want. So they might become an expert on pulmonary embolism, and that group might become an expert on community-acquired pneumonia, and the other group might become an expert on viral bronchitis. You get the point, right? Each one becomes an expert. And in addition to thinking about what the knowledge is that they're gaining as experts, their second charge is, how are we gonna teach that to our classmates? Oh, I think it would be really good if we found an X-ray of pneumonia, and then we could talk about consolidation. And another group might say, well, let's use this case story of this person who had a PE and the sequelae that happened when it wasn't caught. And then the other students might say, well, this lab test is the gold standard. Let's see if we can explain more about this by actually demonstrating how this test is done, right? So they're thinking both as students and educators. And then what you do is you take, say your five people who are experts in PEs and you send them out and you match them up with one person from each group so that now you have a group of people who are experts in nothing together, but each person is an expert in their own thing. Does that make sense? And then you teach each other. So the group is now pulmonary embolism expert, community acquired pneumonia expert, right? Lab test expert. And then they start talking to each other and they have to teach each other. It's really pretty robust. So I think that you would enjoy doing that um, if you have the opportunity. Now you can certainly send students off to do that if it feels like too much time. You can have that be an in or out of class experience. So, anyone have a thought-provoking question? No, nah, that's why I thought of one before I came. So, I want you to take a moment and think about what you've learned so far that you might incorporate into your next lecture. Just ponder that. And then in a moment, I'm gonna ask you to turn to your neighbor or someone behind you and discuss it with them. Go.
And I'll just give you a minute to do that, just so you get that sense of what it's like to turn to. See? <laughs> oh no, you can talk to me. <laughs> Part is always getting the students back together. See what I mean? Okay. So how many people noticed how loud it got in the room? Isn't that fun? I think it's really fun to be up here. And um, Bill came up and, and was my partner and shared some things. But I think that sometimes when you look out at your students and you have a little bit of that glaze going on and you're trying not to take it personally and in our um, school, you know, it's Oregon, so we can't use paper anymore. And we have to have everyone on their computer. And I know Memphis is freaking me out. I have like a stack this big as a tree cycle, and I don't know what to do with it. Like put in the plane home. I, anyway, so, you know, you, you sort of don't know what's going on out there. You're like, you with me? You not with me? I don't know. And so I think when you, when you have these moments and it gets loud and people are talking, I mean, you hope most of them are talking about what you asked them to talk about. Um, and then you, you know, spot check in. Um, but I think it, it wakes everybody up and, and it can give you um, a chance to see people be excited about learning. So anyone want to share what they might have thought about or learned from their partner? Yes. No, you're, you're good, you're catching on. So um, anytime you can revitalize people, and that's a really good word, I think you're extending that period of prime time one and prime time two, right? So we didn't take 20 minutes to have a break, right? But we hopefully revitalized our thought process and were able to meet someone new, right? And, uh, and have a little bit of sharing. And so you can imagine if we went through and had the opportunity to talk to more people, um, we could make it quite a, an interesting um, session, yes. Excellent. I would, I would like to have the recommendations. The question, just, just let me tell, the, the question was um, that our, our teammates here talked about what bars they went to last night. And so perhaps they would like to share the best bars in Memphis. Just kidding, really. Oh, kidding. I think you nailed it. So just to, to repeat in case anyone didn't hear, um, the jigsaw example can be a really good um, flipped classroom experience. You can designate five people and say, go home, become an expert on this topic. You might want them to work in a group together outside of your classroom. You might not. They might Google Docs together, right, and um, you know, Skype each other and talk. We, we don't necessarily care how they do it. But, um, but then they come back and um, they have the opportunity to mix in and you might have some class time where they teach each other. So I think that's a really good use of one of these techniques if you wanted to expand it and, um, and literally flip your classroom. These are some other examples of things that I like to do, and, and you may know many of them. So demonstrations can definitely be a little bit passive, but they're certainly more interesting and engaging than me continuing to talk. So if I said, come on up and gather around me and I'm gonna show you how I put the wires on this simulated patient to do an EKG, that's at least gonna be a little more active, if only because they're standing around and watching instead of sitting around and listening. So hands-on practice, right? Here's some EKG wires, y'all you know, go on each other and put the wires on. Um, I like recess, we don't actually do this, but um, I learned this from my nephew. He said, school is always better when you get to play. And so I think if there were a way to give our students more than one hour break in the middle of the day, right? If they had 20 minute recess breaks, I mean, our students are out there Again, it's Oregon, but they're playing hacky sack and frisbee and you know running around and stuff like that. And I think if we had a culture that embraced that a little bit more, um, we might see our students, particularly our active learners who can't sit still, um, doing a little better in class. 
as we work through. One of the things that I think you're probably familiar with, you know, YouTube, you can watch some videos, get a TED Talk. I'm a super big TED Talk fan, and so I watch these all the time, right? But there's a TED Talk about everything. And so in the old days, I always just put lots of quotes in my lectures, like you could see. But now I'm like, oh, let's hear it from somebody who says it better than me, and let's watch a TED Talk. The Khan Academy, right? So you could do some teaching, but you're basically, you know, back, um, putting somebody else's teaching style on your back and learning. Chunking just means a way of uh, putting some information together and giving them a little package of stuff to think about. So again, we all want to be excellent teaching institutions. And so one of the things that I think we do very badly um, is we bring in these bright, engaged, thoughtful, excited people, and we try to just damp the heck out of all of that. And, <laughs> and, and we, will, we do it for their own good, right? You know we do. But I think if we can encourage some of those um, excited times, if we, can, if we can let them play, right, in their minds, I think we can really help them see a, how much fun it will be to be a PA, because you know this happens all the time. Your first year students are like dead by the end of the year, and they're like, I hate you so much, you ruined me, oh, why did I come to PA school? And you see them like a month later when they're on rotation, and they're like all dressed up, and they look fabulous, and their skin's glowing, they're like, oh, being a PA is the bomb. And you're like, yeah, I know, but you had to go through that first part to get to the second part, but I want some of that glory, like I want you to not hate me. That's what this is really about. I don't want you to hate me. So if you can find a way for them to not be completely burned out, right, whether it's in 50 minutes or in a semester, I think we're doing a good thing. So are they learning how to learn, right? We say this all the time, and I think the people who do PBL get this, the people who TBL get this, the lecture, those of us, we need to bring a little bit more of it on where I'm not just telling you what to know, but I'm teaching you how to learn. Right? And that's what that second year is all about. Lifelong learning, right? Nobody's standing next to you telling you what to do, but somehow they know what to do. So we need to practice that a little bit more in the first year, I think, to give them confidence. So sometimes people say to me, and this did just come up a moment ago, but if I take 20 minutes out of my lecture to do some kind of fun thing, then that's 20 minutes of knowledge that I can't teach them that I can't share from my years and years of wisdom as a PA, because I know so much that if I only had 20 minutes more, they could be even more awesome. <laughs> and, and someone who is um, an educational scholar said to me when I tried to explain that, um, think about what you want them to know in two years. Really, how long does it take to take that, that time? How long does it take to teach them one thing, maybe two things to remember, down the road. So pulmonary embolism, you're not gonna remember all those fine little points I told you, but you might remember two things, right? You might remember my scary story of that patient that I almost didn't catch, and then you might remember what test you're supposed to do. Or you might just remember that it exists and you're supposed to ask somebody if somebody comes in with panicky chest pain, right? So they're really, you really can sometimes boil this down to just a smidge of information. And sadly, the truth is that we're not learning what you were teaching them for 50 minutes anyway. They just weren't, right? At the very best case, they were zoned out for that 20 in the middle. And on a good day, they might have been picking up some of that prime time stuff, but they weren't necessarily learning. And so none of us want to be that teacher in the Charlie Brown cartoon, right? That's sort of like wah, wah, wah. But, but I feel like I am that teacher a lot. So I think that you really need to um, break it up and get people's attentions. So again, another quote. We don't want to demean the lecture, right? I think it's a really important tool. It's lasted for hundreds of years for a reason. It's not something that we want to get rid of totally, if you ask me. But we want to use it when it makes sense, right? Just like any other tool, right? We don't want to use a hammer when we need a saw. We don't want to use PBL when we need a lecture. So as we talked about in the beginning, there are definitely times when this will be your best friend. And if you're not doing it all day, every day, students will appreciate that, I hope, right? I think now they're just like, oh, there she is again. She's standing up in front of the classroom. Hold on, you know, let me get through the next 20 minutes. But if they're like, hey, I haven't seen you in a while. We didn't hear from you. Let's hear a lecture. That'll be really good, right? I'm just dreaming that someday. <laughs> that someday they will say that to me. All right, and again, this is another favorite quote of mine. Um, 
So we need to take the bull by the horns, right? We need to be the ones to change this because our students are leaving us behind. They are, they are not always listening and they are wanting to do things differently. And it doesn't mean we don't know what's best, but we have to meet them at least halfway, right? Because we need them to come with us, right? We need to take them on this journey because we know where we're going is so wonderful, right? We know that being a PA is the most awesome job in the world, but we just have to keep getting them there. And sometimes rather than tugging them, you know, we have to entice them a little bit. And I think this can really help. So I do have some references for you. I have the brain book that I think, again, very helpful. Then the Barclay book is the one that has all the fun things to do in the downtime. And I do want to show you one little thing. Let's see if I can get this to work. There was a really cool video at the end. Can you see if there's one more slide? Two, yeah, okay. So um, you might have to do this from the back, but if you were to, yeah. Um, in a moment, can you play this and I want you to watch this and let's play it like two or three times in a row and I want to point out a couple things. So if you don't mind hitting that play, that'd be awesome and just do it, do it like two or three times for us. So watch that team, okay? And then watch them again. Watch them one more time. Okay. This is the way I think about our institutions and our faculty. So <laughs> takes a village, right? We got a big crowd of people here. Most of the people are standing on the bottom and supporting us. So not everyone is coming along on this interactive journey, but those people are really important, right? And some of them are those sages that you don't want to get off the stage. There's only two people who are flipping. It's not always pretty, but they get there, <laughs> right? So we want to be those people or support them. Then that one in the middle, she's just twirling like, yeah, look at me, give me my attention. So sometimes you can distract people if you're a great speaker, but generally, again, you're just trying to balance those people who are really trying to do something dynamic. And um, I hope that after you've had a chance to um, talk with me today that you will go forth and be those people. So thank you so much for your kind attention.